The function of leadership is to produce more leaders, not more followers. Welcome to the Paid Forward Society, where we believe that leadership is a continuous learning journey and where knowledge is passed on to the next generation of leaders. I'm Roman Jordan. I've been learning and practicing management of global teams for about 10 years. In this podcast, we will explore the many facets of leadership as we talk to inspiring managers, entrepreneurs, coaches, veterans, and athletes who empower their teams and deliver results. Together, we will discover the keys to success through empathy, purpose, and care. So join me as we embark on this journey to become better leaders and create a better world. And we are live. Perfect. Hi, Devo. Welcome to the Paid for Society. I'm really super excited to have you on the show. Really. Thank you. I'm glad to be here, and I'm looking forward to connecting with you today. So both of us, we work at Amazon Web Services, um, but we never work together. Actually, I discovered you um, in an article that it uh, about you six to building world class teams. So uh, I leave the link in the notes. And oh. you know what? The first thing that I that struck me uh, was this big smile on your face on this picture, and and also with the title, I have to say I wanted to know more. Okay. So uh, and then. You got me at, uh, I'm going to quote, it's okay to be a human leader in the digital virtual workplace. Being a human leader means leading with a belief that work performance and empathy go hand in hand. Yes. And then you said, as a leader, it's my responsibility to ensure my employees thrive. So I knew immediately that I wanted to talk to you <laughs> from there. That's perfect. Thank you. I believe, I believe that deep in my heart to be very true. So um, I'm excited about the discussion. And, and, and then I look at your uh, LinkedIn profile. So first of all, I was impressed about your experience and everything that you have done. You know, I mean... The man has, has been uh, in software development, global operations, sales, human resources, supply chain, risk and procurement. I mean, you have done it all. So That means I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about it today. Okay. You are experienced. That's what we say, right? <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. Sure. <laughs> so, yeah, I reached out and uh, you were super quick to answer. Um, we met. I scheduled a 15 minutes, uh, you know, uh, meeting to talk to you about the podcast and what uh, I wanted to talk about. And and actually, we talked much more than at TV date. I mean, uh, I think we, sp we spoke for more than uh, almost one hour. Yes. And it was super fun. So uh, when we hang up, I, I, I talked to my wife and said, wow. It's going to be an amazing episode, I'm sure. We're going to have fun, and uh, hopefully uh, we will have fun together today. Excellent. I'm looking forward to it. I'm uh, not only honored to be here and honored that you ask, but also believe so uh, much in what you're doing, uh, paying it forward, uh, and taking the opportunity to capture uh, good best practices and great stories for people to tap into uh, when they're feeling like they need a little bit better direction or guidance or need a testimony uh, to apply. And so I think it's a very apropos time to be able to do this with you to share my stories. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you. So before we go and, and dive deeper, uh, can you introduce yourself? Yes. Um, my name is Daryl Hammett. I'm the general manager for global demand and operations for AWS Marketing. I've been here a little over two years and having a ball. Every day is an adventure. Wow. 
That's good. That's a strong intro already. <laughs> so I read some of your articles. I, I also you know, spent some time on your LinkedIn profile, as I said. And there are a few topics that I would like us to discuss. And um, one of them is your experience in the US Navy. I, I noticed that I don't have a military background myself, and uh, but I'm fascinated by fascinated by um, some of the stories shared by veterans. Mm -hmm. So, um, if that's okay with you, I'd like to start with this. And uh, if you could tell me what you learned about leadership when you were in the army. Well, I was in the Navy, and let me start with the most important lesson that I learned. It's not about me. So often we think leadership is about the leader, but leadership has nothing to do with the leader. The leadership, true leadership, is all about the people that you are responsible for in leading. So leadership broken down is how you lead others, how you engage, uh, how you model, how you show up. And so the most important lesson I learned in the United States Navy that I loved and adored my experience there um, was that leadership is nothing about the leader. Leadership is all about the people you serve. That's powerful. So I believe you were not a, in charge of people when you were at the Navy, right? You were not leading teams, were you? Well, for, for times yeah. I was, yes, 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 uh, in charge. Uh, and and uh, actually when I be, went to boot camp, um, they made me in charge of my group of recruits. Uh, and I was a recruit chief petty officer. Wow. And uh, that was my first day of 50 people that I did not know from all over the United States and also U.S. territories like Puerto Rico uh, that could be a part of our uh, military. So uh, I learned very, very quickly that leadership is looked upon differently because people's needs are very different. I remember Diaz. His name was Diaz. Um, he could not speak English very well. So boot camp was very difficult for him, reading the books and engaging in the lessons and learning about the training. And I still have this letter today. Diaz wrote me the most touching letter. Um, he did not make our eight-week cutoff. He did not learn fast enough. He did not pass the tests uh, fast enough. But I would sit up at night with him in his rack and try to help him learn the calls, the cadences, the technical things that you needed to learn to pass the basic assessments that you had to every two weeks you had an assessment to pass. But he knew how much I cared for him. And he wrote in his letter because he didn't speak very English very well, but he wrote in his letter that how much he appreciated me taking the time to work with him. And although he didn't make it, he would make it. He had to, he was bumped down to uh, spend another three or four weeks in training because he needed more training uh, to be able to pass how much that meant to him. But uh, he does not know how much that letter impacted me. Um, it made me recognize as a leader and being um a leader of people and serving others, which was really what leadership was about, was meeting people where they are. And he was just as important as uh, everyone else, even though he couldn't speak English very well and people really dismissed him um, and didn't value him, but he was important. Um, and he was a part of a team and he didn't make it with the rest of us. And, but I've, didn't leave him behind. I did all I could as a recruit chief petty officer in charge of all the recruits, getting them up out of the racks, getting them to breakfast on time, getting to caters, getting them to drills on time and all those things that I was responsible for. Uh, but I was also responsible for people who couldn't keep up. And uh, he was one of the people that taught me a very good lesson very early in life was that everyone matters. Uh, everyone matters. 
Um, and then it is not his responsibility. It is my responsibility to meet him where he is. Mm-hmm. I was the one responsible. So let's double click on that. Uh, you said that everyone matters and um, that not everybody is going to make it. So how do you deal with that as a leader? First of all, you have to recognize again that it's not about you. It is about the culture you create, about the clarity of your expectations the consistency uh, in delivering those expectations and following up and accountability, and that you can have a performance management culture with accountability, but you can also be empathetic. So if a person isn't keeping up with the group or the norm uh, or the bar, in this case at Amazon, keeping up or maintaining the bar, We have to interrogate why. And that's where empathy comes in. Because there are a lot of things that impact people that get in the way of them maintaining, keeping the bar, or raising the bar each year, or meeting the bar that we raise each year. And I have found that when you start getting into it and connecting, when people look at their 40-hour work week, And of the things that impact their 40-hour work, we've got the drive to work, Mm -hmm. working from home, um, the being the mother, being the coach, being the caretaker of older parents, being and not having Wi-Fi. There is a lot of things that get in the way of people meeting the bar before we should hold them unfairly accountable for the gap that they're, they're not meeting interrogating and understanding what's getting in the way because i have found sometimes it's a gets in the way is not having clarity on where the bar is not having consistency in delivering the message about the bar not having the right follow up or right tools or right support um in that And so there's a lot of things that we need to understand and be empathetic about before we say, oh, you're not going to make it, or you didn't make the cut, or uh, or you're an LE, or not performing, or Lord. There's a lot of things that we should interrogate first as a leader to make sure that this person is being set up for success. Because I have found 60 to 70% of the people who we say in my career or didn't meet standard or did not have the best performance or meet the, there were things that we could control as leaders to create a better environment for them. And my 30 years of leading by, by and large, it's a lot of management and directions or goals not being set properly that actually got in the way of people not meeting their goals. What you just said reminds me of a conversation I had in a previous episode with um, Alice Anubad. And actually, you said several things that resonate very well with what she said. So I would need to introduce your, you to her. Um, one of the big topics that uh, she kept raising was um, how important it is for a leader to be curious. Uh, not curious in the sense of learning and growing uh, But in this case, you know, uncovering what's what's happening on the other side. So, well, uh, the perspective of others, and, and as you said, um, uh, what is gaining on their way? Yes. So, how do we do that? Sure. I think the most important um, thing that we can do as a leader is be present, number one, and nowhere else. That is a principle that um, I learned a long time ago from a good friend of mine, Susan Scott, who uh, wrote the book Fierce Conversations and went on to write Fierce Leadership. One of her seven principles in Fierce Conversations is for a leader to be present and nowhere else. It's like engaging you right now. I'm not on the computer. 
I deliberately and intentionally allowing you to see my hands. And this is what I do actually when I engage my team to let you know that I am focused on you and nowhere else. So what that in turn, what in turn happens is that you feel safe. Like, okay, I'm his priority right now. This interview is the priority right now. He's nowhere else but right here with me. So whatever I say to him right now, I know that he's actively listening, which is the second step. Active listening does not mean talking. <laughs> Active listening does not mean waiting to get my point across. Active listening means this truly. Listening for what is not being said and listening to learn from what is being said that may change my point of view before I argue my point of view. So to me, being present and nowhere else, interrogating the reality of what we're dealing with by asking questions, and then actively listening, not to twist the facts to meet my theories, mm -hmm. but to actually listen to what could be getting in the way. Is it time management? Clarity in direction, support, something going on outside of work that is impacting your ability. So we may need to set a different time because it may not work in terms of the time because you have a family emergency, your child is sick, et cetera, et cetera. But actively listening to maybe learn and allow you to change my point of view by listening to you and then asking questions to interrogate through reality, because you may tell me everything I need just by listening. Yeah. I think um, in one of the other article, you mentioned giving bar raising feedback. For a long time, I found it was incredibly difficult to provide good, uh, as in actionable feedback. I think I'm getting better at it, but uh, I still have room for improvement. So, uh, you know, taking into account what you just said about um, active listening, what is a bar raising feedback? How do you do that? Great. If you read one of my other articles, it was talking about as leaders, we're always under construction. Yeah. <laughs> so, we are. We, we don't often admit that we're always under construction, but as leaders, great leaders, let me caveat that, great leaders are always under construction. Here's what I mean by that. You never will give everyone the same feedback the same way because everyone around you's needs are different. Yeah. And so as a leader, you're constantly evolving. You never arrive. Never arrive. If you are a great leader, you never arrive. You're constantly evolving because the people around you are constantly changing. Their needs are constantly evolving. They go up, they go down, they grow sideways, they move up, they uh, have tough times or they have great times. So if they're constantly evolving, why aren't I constantly growing as a leader? To engage where they are. Again, remember, it's not about me. So if I want to be a great leader, then everybody around me is totally different than I am. Mm -hmm. And I say that as a great leader, because as a great leader, then you are going to give feedback and meet people where they are. And you will be logical with the people who are more logical. 
you will be more empathetic for the people who need you to be more empathetic. You will be more emotional for the people who need to have a more emotional connection, who are intuitive naturally. You will be more will-driven or straightforward for the people who need more directness. Mm -hmm. You will be more analytical for the people who are more analytical. You will be more situational because you realize that some people are really more in need of delegation than direction. And some people are more directive than delegation. And so when you look at it, a great leader goes up and down on the spectrum of leadership. You never arrive. And you're always going to go across as well. And if you're not, then you're not bringing people or hiring or, or recruiting talent around you to make you better. I am who I am today because of all of the diverse people I've had around me over the years. They have just poured into me. My people, and I say this, if you read some of my articles, my people make me go better. They make me better every day. There's nothing like having 25 or 30 different people around you that have different needs that are up and down, who've gone to different schools and had different educations, who lived in different places, different parts of the world, who pour into you. Dude, you become a treasure chest of experiences that then allows me to pull out of my treasure chest of tools, to your point, any tool I need to deal with any of the situations that I'm encountering and giving feedback. Cause I said, Oh yeah, I got that. You know what? That this person doesn't need a hammer in their conversation. They need a screwdriver. So let me pull out of my treasure to toolbox of treasures of experiences and pull out a screwdriver because this person's needs are different and it's because I'm growing. And so you never get there, but what you do is build this toolbox that I call my treasure chest of experiences, my treasure chest of conversations, my treasure chest of talking and saying, okay, I remember this. I had a parent, I had a parent before talking to me about the same thing about being a caregiver at home and balancing all these different things and the trade-offs they were having to make. So here are the things that I can bring to this conversation. So if you're open as a leader, you will have a huge treasure chest and that treasure chest will allow you to pull out any tool you need in any given situation and be prepared for what that person needs in front of you. Those are the great leaders. And so if you are great at pulling out those different tools and you need to give tough feedback or direct feedback, you'll recognize it isn't about 10 or 15 things that a person needs to focus on. What is the most important thing that's getting in your way of your results? And then let it just unravel. Listen, just look. What is the most? And when I give my feedback to my team today, I don't focus on 15 opportunities. I don't focus on all this. I say, what is the most important uh, superpower that you want to work on this year? And then the follow-up is kind of a what I call a reverse mentoring question. A lot of people don't get into reverse man, Chris, because it requires you as a leader to be vulnerable. Mm-hmm. How can I help you get there? So we're learning. We're going to learn and grow together. Yeah. So what this do you is need if you ask any of the people that report to me, I'll say, only one thing we come out, out of their forte review or out of me, what is the one thing that we're going to focus on this year? And then I'm going to be a partner with you. And every time we meet, every time we come together and connect, we're going to talk about that one. How are you doing in this area? And how can I help you get there? Meaning we are doing this together. Continue to work. Your strengths are strengths. Keep going, run that race. You're doing phenomenal. But this one area that we've identified you need to work on, whether it's delegation, or being more direct, or whether it's being a better writer or a better communicator, or being a better leader and focusing on um, being more effective in communications and meetings and keeping people on task or whatever that the, the what we've identified is, we focus on that one thing to master it. You got to understand to master it is we're going to focus all year. It's back to that ten thousand hours drives that 
opportunity and weakness to a mastery level scale, but that's all we're going to focus on this year. And if you're continuing to do that every year and you're focusing on, then you're going to build a treasure chest for them. And you'll benefit by going along with them on the journey. I like that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. So if I go back to the question about uh, giving bar raising feedback, it's uh, it's basically being able to adapt to each and everyone's needs, adapt to their communication styles and uh, and the way they can ingest uh, what you are saying and, and um, embrace what you are saying. And um, leveraging your own stories to help them and, and guide them and give examples and uh, and uh, and also as you said uh, being vulnerable in the sense that uh, you don't have all the answers but we are on a journey together to to get those answers is that right that is correct thank you thank you that's Super useful. I think related to that, uh, there was an, another um, quote from your article that talk about empathy. Mm. You said, by leading with empathy and example, I'm able to build sustainable and authentic relationships with my teammates making us more resilient to changes that arise. Yes. So I, I wanted to, do, to ask you, how do we do that in practice? Because um, I think we all get a sense of how important empathy is. But sometimes we are lacking the way of, okay, how do I do that? Because um, I, I want to do, I want to demonstrate that I am empathetic, um, that I can help them, that I understand them. Actually, I I listened to a podcast um, recently, and um, they shared the etymology of empathy. I had no idea that uh, it basically means suffering with someone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So meaning that um, if you are an active listener, you try to understand their point of view and what they are going through, then you can develop this empathy or you can be in their shoes and understand what they are going through, which make you uh, made, which make things easier for you to understand what what's going on and, and maybe give you some idea on how to help them. That's very good. Let me take a step back and what is a part of that that I want to make sure you understand become that comes before empathy is authenticity. Um, and I think I said that in that article then the, the, why people lose the direction when it comes to empathy or even when it's coming to striving to be the world's best employer. Okay. These are all aspirational soft and can't really get my hands around it. Why people struggle with those two things or ideals around being empathetic or striving to be the world's best employer is we forget that the most important step first is authenticity. And here's what that means. You can't empathize with someone if you're first not self-aware. Self-awareness or no know, is known as self know thyself is the first step in being an authentic leader. Knowing thyself means I'm not going to compromise my values, compromise my principles. For anyone, for any reason, even when it's more popular to do so. That's what people don't recognize. If you're not grounded in authenticity first, 
because you are aware of your own shortcomings. You're aware of your own issues. You're on, you're aware of your own shortfalls and you won't come and say, Hey, you know what? I know I'm not the best at the uh, best leader uh, and listener. So when you hold me accountable, when we sit down, you make sure that if I'm over talking, you cut me off and say, Daryl, you're over talking today. But the most authentic leaders say that up front, hold me accountable to this because I know myself and I have a tendency to not listen or get up. So tell me when I'm not engaging you. That is being empathetic, knowing who you are and representing first that I'm an authentic leader. And by being authentic and sharing with you where my opportunities are and where I may mess up or mistakes that I have made pulls you in because empathetic leadership is all about making people feel like they belong. Mm -hmm. You got to say, we all have a real deep sense of we want to belong to something. We want to belong to our social group. We want to belong to our neighborhood. We want to belong to the athletic group. We want to belong to the clubs. We all have a desire by nature how we are all wired to belong to something. Yeah. And so when we come to work or when we come to be a part of a team or a group or an organization or a company, we tend to lean naturally to the companies that are more authentic self-aware, we tend to embrace and feel good about that team that is empathetic because they make me feel comfortable belonging. I don't have to compromise myself or compromise my authenticity to belong. Do you see how I just get yeah. connected that all together? Because if you want people to be their best at work or in your presence or on your team or engagement, they have to know that you're empathetic because you're self-aware. You have your, you know who you are as a leader and you're true and you show up every day and you are authentic. And then you're saying by your model and by your example saying, we want people that are different. We want people to challenge us. We want people to be better. We want you to, you can belong to my group. You can belong on my team. You can feel safer. You can be comfortable because we are empathetic because we are self-aware of know what our needs are and we need more people like you or we need more people like you and you can fit. And we're not so rigid that you have, to, we're going to make you fit into a block we are able to be molded and shaped by the people who come in and we know we have areas that we can grow in. So help us to grow. So empathy or empathetic leadership starts with authenticity. And the major part of authenticity is self-awareness. Know thyself. And teams know thyself. It's authentic teams. Teams need to, hey, we, hey, you know what? We all have... We, we have everybody that plays baseball. We need somebody that plays basketball on this team. We need somebody that plays football on this team. We are too much of a baseball team. You know, everybody here plays baseball. So we need to mix it up a little bit. But you can't admit that if you're not self-aware. You can only be self-aware because you're authentic enough to be honest with yourself and have the conversation that we have all baseball players. I've had everybody because I like baseball. I've had everybody who's baseball players. We need to have more inclusion. Do you see where I'm going? And that inclusion is empathetic. It is recognizing we have an opportunity. And then when you and people come in, like, I feel like I belong here because they know they need me. Yeah. They engage me. They're willing to hear my ideas. So therefore you're practicing empathy. Does that make sense? Oh, totally. Yeah. I stay quiet because I'm actively listening and uh, inspired. <laughs> I hope this is helpful. Because it is. It is at least for me and uh, hopefully for, for others, but uh, definitely, definitely useful. We start sometimes with the person in that scenario of empathetic leadership. Understand. But we're not being empathetic with ourselves through authenticity. Don't understand. 
what are we bringing to the table? <laughs> what? Where do we get it wrong? And we don't do this even as parents, right? We don't, hey, it's always the kid's fault. Like, wait, 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 wait a minute. You lost money. You made bad investments, but did I teach you how to invest? Did I set a good example? Did I take you to the bank and open the bank account and show you how to invest and whatever? So when you keep asking me for money, are you asking me for money because I really didn't teach you how to invest? So when you have that conversation with self, then it's less about the kid's ability to manage their finances is more about, I need to take responsibility. I didn't teach you that. So maybe I need to do something differently. Yeah. That's a great, great example. <laughs> Relating to, <laughs> to a case with my kids uh, where I could have applied that indeed. We all could have, but it's about moving forward. Right. Yeah. It's about moving forward and everything else before today, before, before time we started here, everything was, everything now after is different. <laughs> Can we talk about lobsters? Sure. Yeah. And how they grow. Yes. And how they grow. How do they grow? Well, you're talking about one of the articles that I wrote in terms of, um, you probably think like, oh, wow, lobsters grow inside of a shell. How does that always happen? Right? And then in, in theory, we're, we're all struggling with, they shed their shells so we can grow and grow another one. How do they do that? Well, I think the, the article that you're referring to is how that we how we can be uncomfortable shedding our old skin and putting on a new one. And yeah. like lobsters grow, right? Um, and sometimes we're uncomfortable, but if you stay in that old shell, the lobster can't grow. The lobster's got to shed that old, sh that old shell and grow another one and to be able to grow into the big lobster that we like to go and <laughs> purchase. <laughs> um, they have to shed the old shell and grow a new one. And I referenced it because a lot of leaders are not willing to let go of the shells that got us here. Yeah. But to get us there or to that next level or to get to that next precipice or that next tipping point um, that we need to evolve. And that's like the description about the, the, the lobster evolving to the point where they shed their old shell so they can grow a new one, so they can grow, right? We're not always comfortable because we are safe in our old shell. But that safety keeps us from actually growing. And like the lobster, we can die if we don't grow. And we may not grow die in the way of a physical death, but we can grow in terms of uh, uh, die in terms of our leadership growth. We could die in a way our team does not grow. We could die in the way of not being able to communicate and engage others where people are willing to stay and engage our team and feel happy and retain. And I feel like, hey, I can learn a lot here because my boss is willing to, or my manager or my supervisor, my director, or my vice president. I clearly see him shedding his old shell every year and raising the bar because he wants to grow. So how can I ever argue with raising the bar when my model is raising the bar and shedding his old shell so that he could grow more? That's a powerful story. And I didn't know that about, uh, about lobsters. So that's, that's super interesting and a very good analogy. I think um, we discussed that with um, Alison in the previous episode where, you know, what. Uh, Leading is about having the courage to go outside of your comfort zone and uh, be vu being vulnerable and uh, willing to learn and try out new things uh, for others to be able to grow as well. Yes. That's a very good story. I need to keep that in Sometimes mind. Sometimes we have a society that doesn't, um, and I want to just add this to that. As that lobster is growing, that lobster has to feel safe that as it's growing a new shell, that is when he or she is the most vulnerable. 
<laughs> yeah. So, um, organizations have to create a safe environment for their leaders to shed their old shell. Uh, no judgment, no criticism, no, but actually incent you on shedding your old shell. Incenting you on wanting to grow. So when you as a leader set that kind of tone and tenor in your group, you're number one, self-aware, which drives authenticity because you realize, hey, you know what? Um, here's my principles, who are here's I am, here's my here's my character, here's my principles, here's my values, here's my personality, here's all here's how I show up every day. Because I know myself. Again, self-awareness is defined as no thyself yeah then i can be empathetic and real with you because i'm comfortable in the skin that i'm in but i'm also comfortable enough to tell you i'm still willing to grow so as i bring in new people on my team i'm shedding old shells and shedding old skin so that i can learn something oh i got a new person that just finished college and oh my gosh you're coming and talking about technology and language and words and things and the new trends and things about new generations oh my gosh i got a headache or at the same time because we have more generations in the workplace that's ever in history we have six to seven generations in the workplace today some people can't afford to retire so they're still well you still have baby boomers working today you got Gen Z's, you know, in the workplace now, butting up against these people. So every day you have to be willing. We live this every day. They're coming in with TikTok and this and this, this and this, this. And you like, okay, well, uh, wait a minute. Um, what's that? Uh, we've been experiencing it here where some people came in and they've been around a while. So they tip, they prefer chime. Yeah. And then. <laughs> So some people, put the, the newer, younger generation comes in and they prefer slack and, and, and automatically have conflict. And sometimes the younger generation says, why are you sending me emails? Can't you just chime? Can you, sorry, can't you just slack that to me? There are literally people here that are not using slack at all. I know. <laughs> so that is a point around growth, right? It's like, okay, I have to be willing to let go of control shed. And allow there to be a diversity of communication coming to me from the people who prefer Slack, from the people who prefer email, from the people who prefer Chime, also from the people who prefer, hey, I want to look eyeball to eyeball. So we're going to talk. Or the people who prefer to, to communicate via docs. Just only. They, hey, you could have you could have sent that to me. We could have tackled that in an email back and forth. But I, I, I want to look at you, look at me, I bought all because... That's my preference of engagement. So great leaders recognize to engage a very multi-generational, multi-need, multifaceted group of people. I got to shed a lot of shells and grow. And I have to be vulnerable in doing so. Yeah. So just for context, because we are working together at Amazon and others may not have uh, any understanding of what Chime is? Yeah. So Chime is our chat um, application, and you can do video, uh, you know, video conference as well. But it's it's used as a chat uh, also yes. internally. I think I think it's a good segue to um, a question I wanted to ask you about uh, remote teams. So, how do we? build that uh, trusting environment uh, and specifically I mean the past uh, two three years we have been in COVID uh, how do we build this environment in a distributed environment when you have people maybe deploy all over the country or even globally uh, so um, and to be frank with you since the, the beginning of the interview I feel connected with you, and, and and you said it earlier. I can show your hands. I can show that you are moving your hands, and 
and I feel connected because because of that. So maybe because I'm I'm French and I, I grew up in a, in a country where we use our hands and we speak like this. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, I think that that's a good tool. I, I should uh, I should uh, take note of it. Take note of it. And uh, I love France, um, parlez vous français. And my son won the national French. Um, competition and actually went and lived in France for a while, Paris. And it's amazing. Uh, so he, he, sp he speaks eight different languages. So yes, I'm very familiar with that uh, multinational world that we live in uh, and remote teams. So to your point, how do we, we don't have a choice. And so I think that's the first thing I need to say. We don't have a choice to be a multinational global team today or global organization. You're going to have to deal with remote in some way, shape, form or fashion because the world is changing and it's changing fast. So it's going to you're going to change with it or it's going to change all over you. Right. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's, that's a really the only option. And I have a team. We're in 39 different countries. I have people all over the world. And uh, we speak uh, 34 different languages on, on my team, within my team of folks. And one of the things that you learn very quickly uh, as a global leader or international leader is that everything isn't centered around my nationality. Okay. So, um that is the first and foremost, most important thing as a global leader, you need to recognize that everything isn't about your culture. Everything isn't about your country and everything is not about you as a leader in the lens you see it through. So you have to think about different things. Like right now, my heart goes out to some of my team that is actually in Paris and they're dealing with the challenges there um, that the protest or yeah. I have people in Turkey who are dealing with the earthquakes. I have people that are Israel was just in Israel traveling with some of my team uh, a little bit ago and recognizing that I have people in China. So dealing with some of the things that are going on there, I have people that are from Ukraine and from Russia. So first of all, recognizing working with global remote teams is that you have to start looking at the world through their eyes. If you're going to really engage them and you really want to connect with them and you want to get the most out of them, you have to recognize what they live with and go through each day. So as a global leader, I make it my business to learn about what's going on around the world every day so that I have an opportunity to connect like you. From Paris, I can talk to you today about uh, if we needed to. Hey, you know, I I see everything that's going on in Paris. How you feeling? Talk to me about how it's impacting you or your family. Mm -hmm. That's typically how I start my remote conversations. And then my time is not my time. My time is their time. So sometimes I have to be in the, up in the morning at 6 a.m. to meet my Singapore team. Sometimes I have to do things late at night or 10 o'clock to meet my EMEA team. So I have to be flexible, agile, present where they are, understanding what's going on in the world around them and how it affects them. So that when we get here and we connect, they trust me. I understand. I'm listening. And then guess what? What happens is they're more connected to my conversation because I first connected with, hey, did you, I didn't know, you realize that there's the protest going on right now in Paris? I, I thank you for, thank you, first of all, for acknowledging it. Um, uh, yes, thank you. That That is impacting my father or my mother or my family members because we have a very lucrative retirement pension plan here that has been here since after the World War II. And, you know, the people having time extended uh, on this, it's, that's a real big challenge for them. And by listening or, hey, in Israel, they're having a tough time with the bombings and when you understand and empathize because you're willing to be authentic and you're willing to learn, people, no matter where they are, they engage. Yeah. 
and then they're actually more productive. They actually are more timely. And then we do global calls that focus on just their their country or their time zone. And it's not all about America's time or the yeah. United States time. So I try to schedule global calls or all hands for their time zones. That's good for them. And we actually do all hands that come out of Singapore or we do things that come out of Israel. So we want them to represent and lead the conversation from their point. And we also celebrate all the major holidays, no matter where the world. So we Chinese New Year, uh, Ramadan, we just, we're we're celebrating that with a team member. We're doing things that make sure we're inclusive of what people are experiencing around the world to show that we're a global team. And then people connect. Again, what I said earlier, people want to belong, even in a remote environment. People want to connect. They want to belong. And when they recognize that you want to connect with them by learning what's going on in their world, then they're 10 times more engaged because they feel like you value them. That's a very good point. And and I think uh, that raised another question for me. Um, Maybe uh, somewhere, uh, a growth area for me. How do we include people in decisions? So I, I get what what you d- describe, and that's really good for uh, keeping in touch with the team and making them um, included and and uh, feel that they belong, that they are important to us. As a leader, you are working on important strategies. Important, uh, you know, uh, try to to define that vision or you work on a, on a big project that would benefit uh, the team. And in a global environment, how do you, how can you be inclusive enough so they can chip in and, and they can also brainstorm with you and, um, and uh, be part of that team? Because I feel that um, I'm trying to connect um at the human level with my team, you know? And uh, I believe that they, they, are, they recognize that and, uh, and usually I, I'm getting good feedback about that. Where I do believe I, I, can, I can grow and I can become better at this, um, is working on those big projects with them and, um, and include them. And that's tough because of, of uh, time difference and um, also you know the the fact that we are distributed so you are not sitting next to me so um uh, how do you do that i think it's a very good and thank you for your humility in talking about an area of opportunity first thank you for being authentic uh, and self-aware to talk about something that you're working on And I 100% agree with you and understand what you're talking about. So here's what uh, I have done to try to deal with that. First of all, I recognize, and it's not complicated. This part is not complicated, but this part is one of the hardest things to do, is be intentional. (laughs) We make some things really complicated, like parenting. Uh, or, or calling my, calling my 75 year old mother, you know, and saying, Hey, you know, you're a two time cancer, cancer survivor and whatever. But I am intentional of texting her every morning and saying, I love you. Uh, and I miss you. And I'm being intentional about spending the week, we- weekend with her. And what she said, What do you want to do when you get here? You know, you, mom, I just want to be present with you. Here's why I use that as an example. Global teams want to be included more than anything because, number one, they feel secondary naturally. Yeah. They yes. do. There's nothing you can do about that. They just, it's, it just comes with the territory, right? They're not, they're, they're not in the headquarters or uh, they're not in Seattle or they're not in, like, oh, I'm not in the big hubs. I'm not in New York. I'm not in Washington. There's not a hundred of us uh, running around talking and going to breakfast together and doing all this. So, first of all, I see secondary. I'm an afterthought. So that's number one. So myself as a leader am more intentional 
And here's what I'm doing about more intentional pulling the projects and bringing them into ideation, the brainstorming. Wednesday is what I call my long day. And Wednesday is my long day very intentionally because I set my clock at noon that day and I go all the way around to 10 o'clock. And I do that one day a week. They all know it. And here's the, I over communicate this. That is my global day. That's when I am the I'm a global practicing and being intentional and being a global leader. That day, my day starts at noon. And everybody knows it. And you can book and we do all meetings from noon all the way to 10 o'clock at night to include all the global leaders to make sure they hear me. We're on calls. They're participating, that we're collaborating. And I'm very into So Wednesday is my global day. I'm very, it's on my calendar. Everybody knows it. So I'm intentional about scheduling it. I'm intentional about following up. I'm intentional about including people on that day globally. I'm intentional about setting up appointments. I'm intentional about bringing people together. That's my global day every Wednesday. And it is a practice of mine religiously. So does it mean that you are, um, it's a, it's a, it's an open agenda and you invite everyone or do you say, okay, we are going to work on this and um, I invite you to, to chip in, to participate. We do all of it. That day we will may have dockery, global dockeries where we're inviting multiple people. We may have global projects where we bring in thought leaders from different parts of the year, like Seattle or San Francisco. That's the day where we put it on their calendars ahead of time. Hey, you, this is a long day. So However you need to manage the front end of your day is your, what you, whatever you do is what you do. But we're going to expect you at seven o'clock at night to be on this call, um, Eastern Standard Time or, or, or Central Standard Time or whatever the case may be, because we're having these people on the phone call and we're going to solve this problem today. It's overly communicated so everybody can make the adjustments because it's important for them to feel included and they have a day. Because we also want them to feel like from a job satisfaction, from an inclusion perspective, from a team effectiveness perspective, they have an opportunity to belong, to have their opinions heard, that everything isn't about our nine to five here in the States, that they feel like they have a day or time that's devoted to their thoughts, their questions, their concerns. Uh, and that's my long day. I call that, that's my global day. Wednesdays are almost always my global days. We do it all. Meetings, touch bases. I have my touch bases with people, my one-on-ones that day, but it's my long day. And everybody knows I block out my morning so I can give them and devote my time to them. That sounds good. I like that. <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah. You just have to be intent. You have to first start with intention intentionality. That is something that we forget that putting it on the calendar and then following through. Yeah. I'm taking a lot of notes. <laughs> oh, well, that's a, believe me, that's the, the they, you have no idea how second class global remote people can feel when you're not being intentional about including them. And it's, it, and here's what it does. It affects team effectiveness. It, it affects project effectiveness. It, it affects collaboration. You don't get a, inclusion, diversity around thoughts and different ideas to see it from a different lens or different point of view. Uh, it's really sad when you're not being inclusive. And I think you can't say you're inclusive if you don't practice and be intentional about being a global leader and representing inclusivity. You're right. Definitely a growth area for me. Um, we're all I'm still going. We're all, leaders. <laughs> we're all leaders under construction all the time. <laughs> I think with um, the authenticity and um, and empathy that we talked about, uh, being intentional, I think uh, I have the ingredients that uh, for a question I wanted to ask you um, about uh, how to inspire teams and and why it is important. 
first of all, I um, want to caution you or any leader about inspiring uh, because sometimes we want to inspire, but the reality is every day we're not going to be inspiring. There'll be tough decisions. There'll be things that everybody doesn't agree with. And sometimes uh, inspiring can turn into a popularity contest. Hmm. And you may, as a leader, make bad calls or not the right calls or be as transparent when you're thinking about inspiration, which is really sometimes a popularity contest. And it's, I want to be liked. Um, and that's why I'm very careful about inspiring. Um, I would lean more to how to create an authentic culture that as a byproduct of that authentic culture it breathes inspiration. It breeds transparency. It breeds inclusiveness. It because it grows. You grow it. Um, you can come in and create a garden with a lot of good-looking plants that are fake, and it look great all year round. Oh my yeah. God! You have the most beautiful garden in the world, but you can't eat any of it. And I believe that when you put away the popularity and trying to be popular, people want authentic leaders that show up and create a genuine culture that grows them through good and great times and bad mm -hmm. times, challenging times, because every day isn't a great day. Every day isn't an inspiring day. As a leader, every day is not a great day. Sometimes you have to make tough decisions that are hard, that are not going to be popular. So I think, what about an authentic culture that is a byproduct of it is inspiration because it's like, I'm inspired by the authenticity and the trueness and transparency of my leader. I'm inspired because he creates an authentic environment where people can feel, belong, and connect. So I think in that... Let inspiration be a byproduct of being authentic and genuine. That, hey, you know what? Some days I don't have all the answers. Hey, you know what? I, I, I don't know why our CEO made that call. I'm sorry, but I'm willing to see here and listen to how that call is impacting you. I think we need to, as leaders, be careful not to get caught up in the I want to get the most likes. Mm -hmm. I want to get the most clicks leader. And I want to be the coolest and most fun and people to like me versus I want people to trust me. I want people to go to war with me. And war sometimes is hard. Yeah. This project is going to be hard. Getting it started is going to be hard. Getting funding for it is going to be hard. And sometimes people are going to leave or quit or not make it, or sometimes going to fall and we have to pick people up. Something's are going to stop and pause and people won't understand what we're going through. So I want you to trust me. I want you to know I'm authentic and genuine. And that I, I want you want, willing to go to fight with me because I'm there with you. And you are inspired by me modeling that authenticity and that trueness and that transparency. And then, therefore, we are willing to create a culture and environment where we retain people. We develop people. People want to be on our team. And we become we are productive and diverse by all of it. And I think it starts with being authentic because I'm, I'm very, very worried about what I see, especially with new leaders wanting to inspire. And I think it's, I call it kind of the click leadership style, which is mm -hmm. I, want the click, I want enough clicks where people like me. And then to your earlier point, we don't often tell people or give them the right feedback or the tough feedback that they really need because we want them to be inspired and liked. And we kind of mix the two a little bit like we shouldn't versus let's create an authentic culture. So whatever conversation you and I have, you're inspired because I'm willing to be honest and say, hey, Daryl, this is not working today. 
You know, you, you, you're not delivering. You're not carrying your part of the load. And you're impacting the team's ability to get results. It's uncomfortable. But it's real and authentic and true. That's that's a very call out, a very good call out. Thank you. Uh, something I need to think about. I think it's uh, very profound indeed. I think um, maybe that's um, <laughs> a urban legend or, or something that is expected from leaders, but. Um, I think it's common for people to expect from a leader to come up with a plan, to come up with a vision, and in that being inspiring. And it's incredibly hard to do that because, as you said, I mean, you don't know what would be the um, exogenous, um, uh, you know, um, parameters that could impact um, your plans and derail everything that you had in mind. But also, uh, ideally, it's it's not coming out of your brain only. It should be a, a plan that everyone can, you know, um, be associated to mm -hmm. and, um, and where they have the opportunity to propose the ideas. And, and this is where we benefit from all the diversity, inclusiv inclusivity, inclusiveness. Oh. Uh, you got it. You, you, you nailed it. I mean, you're back to our original point of the conversation when we started, which is what did I learn in the Navy? Leadership is not about the leader. Leadership is about other people leading because you enable them as a leader to let them lead. They own the culture. They own the inspiration. They own it because we have a perverted society today that leaders want to be the standard bearers and they want to get all the credit and they want to. But what happens when that leader falls down? What happens to the team that was not built to withstand the wind and the rain and the layoffs and the challenges and economy and the, the pivots and all adapting and whatever, because you haven't taught them to be authentic and real and engage and process. Do we have too much on our plate? Are we prioritizing right? Are we making the tough decisions along the way to trim the fat around our priorities so we can focus on the most important thing? So you develop a muscle that no matter what storm or tornado or hurricane comes, the leader is not the one who's in the front. The leader is actually in the middle. And the team coalesces around the leader because the leader, hey, I want to belong. I want to fit. I want to connect. I want to be uh, engaged. I want to be inclusive. All this. So I call. And the tighter that group is, they can weather any storm that comes their way. So inspiration is a part of what the group holds al along with inclusivity along with transparency, with uh, along truth telling and saying exactly what's wrong and what's with globalization because they're willing to connect with empathy because we're willing to make sure that we're authentic enough with ourselves to be self-aware where we as a group where we may struggle, where we may be too logical as a group. We've hired too many logical people or we're not. We don't have enough intuitive people who have more thinking of their gut or analytical people who can process and make sure our projects stay on time and we can track our projects or visionary people that can see and plan and design. So when you mix a group up and you have all this, that is your inspiration. And it's less about the leader and more about the group because the best leaders of the world don't lead. They support. They just support the they support the people who are driving the vision. They support the people who want to own it and do it. And it's less about the person in the front carrying the flag. Because I'm going to tell you something, when you're carrying that flag and the wind blows and you fall down, um, there's a lot of people behind you. I call it, the, I call it actually the shiny pebble syndrome. And if you have a leader that's out there just going along the beach and they're just pointing out everything and this is the way we're going and this is what we're going to do. And all of a sudden they walk, run, walk over a shiny pebble. Hey, shiny pebble, stop. And they're picking up and focusing on the shiny pebble. 
Guess what happens to everybody behind them that's following? They stop. They stop. You don't have progress. Yeah. You never go because if that that shiny pebble can throw, but if you have the leader in the middle or even behind, and you have seven or eight strong team leaders, or you have multiple layers of leadership in this group, you will always have a healthy tension that's saying, hey, we need to balance this perspective. We need to include these kind of, we need to get this thought, balance this idea. Of it. You will always have this healthy tension around growth, uh, authenticity, inclusion, team effectiveness, um, will drive you. And all the leaders got to do is sit back and say, I got the right people. How do you map that out? How do you know that you have the right team, the right people? First, you need to make sure that you hire people that are completely different than you are. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> let me be clear. The first thing is, if you're only playing basketball when you come to your meetings, then there is a problem. And everybody else is not like... Um, I play tennis and I do this. I do baseball. Hey, I do hockey. I do this. I do that. Do you know what the diversity of all of that will bring to that team? Because the, here's here's what people don't get out of that, that, that example. This is what people don't get out of diversity and inclusion either. Everybody will be inspired in that room to say, you know, I never played baseball. Hey, can you teach me how to do that? Hey. And, and oh, well, I play tennis. You want me? I'm gonna teach you how to play tennis. If you have ten sports in there that, that are all different, ten sports times ten lessons times ten times practicing times. Do you know the diversity and power of that group over time? Because each learns to be a little bit better because they get to see, they get to participate, they get to engage. And, and that's my point around the inspiration comes from the power of the group feeling secure, authentic, strong. I can go over there and ask this question. I get, And it's wide open for growth. That's what the true power of diversity and inclusion is about is I want to bring somebody so I can learn. I, I want to learn what you got. I, I want to learn that thing. I've never played basketball in my life, but you, that looks cool. And I, you teach me basketball, and I'll teach you how to play baseball. You teach me badminton, and I'll teach you how to do hockey. You teach me boxing, I'll teach you how to play flag football. The, this is how you grow a team that is multifaceted. And no matter what storm comes their way, you can turn to anybody on the team and say, hey, what do you think? Give me your point of view. What? You can't have but great results when you have diversity. So my point is, to your point, how do you build effective teams? You get diversity and inclusion to be your number one thing. And here's what I mean by diversity and inclusion. You have analytical people. You have logical people. You have intuitive people. You have visionary people. You have analytical people. You have people that are senior. You have people that are mid. You have people that are junior. You have different ages. You have different genders. And you build a team that represents strength in diversity. People have concocted and made diversity into just about ethnicity or gender. Diversity is the gamut of all things. Mm -hmm. Everything. You want global perspectives to get a different point of view of how how are people uh, here? And, well, there you can't do that. This um, that's Chinese New Year, so we can't plan to do anything during that time because that may impact. Oh, great! I'm glad to, we have somebody here who who brings a different point of view. This we got to plan for that. Oh, hey, Daryl, you can't do this. This you got to remember this time of the year is this. Or hey, you got to think about this when we say this because that may. That may not be the right way we want to position that. Let's look at it this way. Um, when you have inclusion, that is when you have your greatest strength as a leader. I love that. I think I think we're clear on the why. I'm interested in the how now. How do I assemble that team? Sure. 
I think there's multiple ways you can do that. Um, over my career, um, I've practiced a few things. I got disciplined in these things to, to do this. Situational leadership. Um, I've also done DISC and Herman Holbrain. And why I prefer those tools um, are very important. First of all, I did Herman Holbrain. I've done DISC for my entire team here. My entire management team has gone through DISC here. Everyone, and I've taught them all. I did all the, the lesson from all 45 managers on my team I've done. Why I did that is I wanted us to know who we were, but also where our opportunities and strengths lie. So as we interview people, as we grow people, as we engage people, recognize how we show up. So I have some people that are more dominant or uh, dominant or, or D's, and they can be extremely directive. But then I have people that are more S's uh, or C's or conscientiousness or more um, people who are about sequencing and getting things in order. Uh, and when you think about all of those people on a team, and if you're not aware of what and how you show up every day, you can derail others or hire people that are just like you and you never build the right teams. So what I have practiced in the before in building teams is Herman Holbrain or DISC to assess where my opportunities were with my teams that we needed to feel. And we've done a, what I call a mapping overlay to say, you know what, we have two. I remember doing this years ago in my startup uh, company. Um, and what I re recognize is as we started to grow our company, we started off as a software company. We were so, uh, the first 30, 40 people we hired were all on the, what's called left side of Herman Holbrain, which were logical and analytical. Well, we needed that. But when we started selling products, we were not doing well because we we only had logical people showing up, going through technical fl workflows and talking about use cases and walking back. And customers like, uh-huh, okay. I have no idea what you just said. But then when we hired people that were to uh, so the other side of the Herman Hall brain, which is more intuitive, more visionary, more creative, more uh, emotionally connecting, which were our sales and account managers, then we started having what I consider to be our whole brain thinking on our team because we everybody who we hired had to take uh, as a part of the process Herman Hall brain so we can understand where our needs were and gaps were on our team so that we didn't over index on too many logical and analytical uh, and we didn't over index. So we actually had a perfect square. We, we, we took the regular assessment. We had a balance in all four quadrants of our Herman whole brain. And we also did disc for our leaders to make sure that we didn't over index and having too many D's for dominant uh, who didn't allow people to have a different point of view because we were so dominant in our thinking. Um, so we balanced our team regularly with DISC and Herman Holbrain said, hey, the next person we hire, we need somebody to be a little bit more creative and visionary because we need to think about our front end experience. We had a great back end, but our front end experience was horrible. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Uh, because we didn't hire enough creative front end designers to take this great back end and make it a user friendly experience for our users. So we learned we needed to have diversity in the great, all the great, we had all the back end work and all the great APIs and all that stuff was wonderful. But when people, it wasn't functional. We didn't think about the buttons in the right places. We didn't think about all. The, and so we needed a front end person to come in and say, hey, that looks great. Why don't you guys stay in the back room? I'm going to go talk to the customers and talk about what they need functionally to make this work for them. Uh, and so that was one of the, the, the how we consistently interrogated how we built a stronger team was we took a Herman Hope brain and DISC and used it religiously to balance out our hiring processes to make sure that we were represented fairly and equally all around the board. I like that. I think a common theme, another one, but a common theme across um, our discussion is uh, the intention, being intentional, in everything that you do, in how you can include people, how you can make a, a diverse environment 
for everyone to thrive. So about uh, how you hire people, how important it is to recognize that um, there are different types of people and you need all of them. I like that. Yeah, it's um, one thing that you, you said and it really resonates. Somebody asked me one day, um, the comment said, hey, how do we support diverse women-owned businesses during Women's Month a month ago? Or so? uh, and, and I said, can you give me three things that we need to do differently? I said, sure. They're probably not the answers you want, but <laughs> yes, I can. Number one, be intentional. Number two, be intentional. And number three, when you go and eat there or when you go in the experience, you intentionally share the story and go back. And like, that, that's easy. And I'm like, it's that easy about everything. Intentionality is the one thing we take for granted when we're dealing with change. Be intentional. Put it on your calendar. Once a month, I'm going to go to a woman-owned business and I'm going to go you know, eat food. So go to Yelp or go to whatever you use to, to search for restaurants. Search for restaurants. I'm going to find a ramen-owned restaurant. And then when I eat there, I'm going to, I'm going to based on the experience, I'm going to go back and eat again. And then I'm going to share it with my, my story with my friends and my family. that I went and had a great experience at this place. Or, hey, they, this this I went to a woman-owned business who does this or does that. And, man, I had a wonderful be intentional and then being intentional again, and then share your story to bring other folks into your community around this. And I think that's a great opportunity around leaders. Be intentional, be intentional. And then say, here's the story. This is the great results we got when we brought in diverse talent. This is the great results we got when we did a woman's day today. I was on a, another group doing a global call today around making it a great place to work. What did I talk about? Intentional about sharing my stories about what we're doing around globalization, what we're doing around um, empathy and what we're doing around being inclusive. Again, be intentional, be intentional, and then share your stories. That's great. Thank you. It's very inspiring. <laughs> I think the, one of the last topic I wanted to address with you is um, scaling through others. You said that you have many managers and you, you create this environment where everyone can, um, can participate. So um, uh, I, I run a survey on LinkedIn and, and um, on Spotify to uh, ask the community of leaders uh, that are that I'm building uh, what are the top topics that uh, they want to uh, to get um, advice about and um, and scaling through others it, it was an important one so uh, any any advice there yes again i want to go back to simplicity is the new innovation and uh, this is uh, something I'm a firm believer in. It's, it's a, I coined this called Sinai. And I work on, very intentionally on it on my team. Simplification is the new innovation is what that stands for, Sinai. I believe that we have made things much more complicated than they really are for complication's sake. I, and I think to grow and to scale, we actually need to think about simplicity and prioritization is the new innovation as a part of that. So here's what I mean by that. I have phenomenal leaders, but if you do not prioritize scaling through, number one, repeatable, scalable behaviors and actions and mechanisms, there's nothing you are going to be able to do to have a healthy, scalable business or help healthy, scalable meeting or team or execution because you first have to expect simple, prioritizing, 
have simplification, prioritizing and repeatable, scalable behaviors and mechanisms for people to go out and execute. I find that prob- the biggest issue with scaling globally is this not repeatable. We reinvent the wheel all the time. Because, but, for no reason whatsoever other than sometimes job justification or I want to be busy, I want to show that I'm doing something. I believe, and I'm, I'm, I've scaled many global things, I believe in the 80-20 rule. Even where geos may have his nuances or language preferences or whatever the case may be. But the 80 20 rule, when it comes to scaling things, are 80% should be replicatable and duplicatable and easy to execute and and, and repeatable. All 80. And then the 20 are the nuances, the preferences, the languages, the diversity of different areas that you need to include in the part of the process just because of the nature where you're doing business. But 80% should be replicatable, should be um, simple. And if you prioritize those things, then scaling becomes a lot easier. Scaling is not as complicated as we make it. I'm sorry, but that is really the simple answer is, when you're building a scale of, of an organization to scale or a product to launch, and when it, mm-hmm. we, need, we need to first think about what are all the ways we can be packaging, simplicity, shipping, simplicity, measuring, single pane of glass that's duplicatable, replicatable, scalable, simple, because all of these things have been prioritized. And I think that those are the things that get in the way of global growth is you try to do everything different in every country for every different group of people all the time gets in the way of having an effective, scalable platform globally. Because I don't think sometimes priority is the um, prioritizing simplification and scalability and replicatable at the front, repeatable and replicatable at the front end is uh, often talked about because we need a mandate in terms of of the charter of what we're doing. The charter is going to start with, okay, number one, we're going to prioritize simplification. So everything we build going forward to, to execute globally, it has to be simple, replicatable, duplicatable, easy to execute, understandable. And then the 20 thing, the 20% that has to be different, we need to understand why it is different. And then of that 20% that is not in the 80, what can we also replicate and duplicate in the process of having diversity and inclusion at a global scale? So how do you do that? Do you, you create playbooks? You create. I, um, I have a playbook for everything, everything that we do. Uh, we have, for, and that's a very good point. We document everything and have created a, a playbook for everything. And we've instituted Sinai as a mechanism on our team, meaning simple is the new innovation. We, we don't do anything new until we interrogate what we already have. Like and it. if we're going to do something different, then what has to happen is something over here has to go away. If it is so important for us to prioritize, then what over here has to be we stop doing to make sure that this priority, if it's so important for us to do and to scale and to build, then what do we need to get out? Because people only have 40 hours in a week. That is where we don't sometimes interrogate is people have poor execution because they're trying to do too many things. Yes. That's why I say prioritizing, prioritizing simplification is <laughs> got to be in the charter. And simplification will force you to say, uh, we want to do that over that, Daryl, but we got all this other stuff we're doing. And I'm going to say, okay, what's the priority? What is the priority? You have to make trade-offs. And we don't get people around the table to have those honest conversations. So we just add more to the plate. And what happens? 40 hours doesn't grow every week. 
They just become watered down and become least effective. I have found out you do smaller projects targeted more to simplification, targeted more to prioritization. You actually get more done with having short, focused, tight projects and timelines, and you can get more done in a year than having long gated projects with long SOWs with so much work to do, you never get it done. And so many interdependencies. I need to invite you to a team meeting. Uh, sorry, say again? I need to invite you to one of my team meetings. Oh, we, we get more done. Uh, you Call me anytime. You can see we, pr- we publish a what we got done last quarter list. And it's amazing because we time ourselves. We get it done in a quarter. We break it down by months. We set it by goals. We put it in the work front. We track it, our progress every week. Everything that everybody on my team does has to level up to their goal. The overall the, the team goal. Nothing you should be doing should not level up to the overall goal. And that's where we keep it all tight and narrow. And every time you have a touch base, you're going in and you're only focusing on the goals that you're supposed to be doing or the tasks you're supposed to be doing to achieve the goal at hand. But that, that allows you to execute more for us. And then we have a high manager satisfaction rate. We have a high connection score rate. Connections is our way we track uh, people's satisfaction. Um, we're in the high 90s on all of those areas because we try to keep people focused. And we say, sure, here's the 10 things I'm doing. You want me to do something different? Then what is the one thing you're going to take off the list? Yeah. That drives scalability right there. Is okay, that's so important. Tell me what you want me to take. I'll, I'll go get I'll go get it done. But tell me of the 10 things I'm doing, what do you want me to take off the list? That changes actually the entire conversation, believe it or not. I do believe in it. Yeah, more and more. Clearly. I need to uh, put that in practice. Thank you. Yeah, and in my, if you can ever come to one of my team meetings, any new idea or concept that is presented, we say, okay, now what are we going to stop doing? If you want to add a new meeting, it's even comes down to a meeting. You want to add a new meeting to the tech because we focus on having 15-minute meetings a 30 minute meetings. If you have any meeting over 30 minute meeting, needs to have an agenda. Why it needs to be over 30 minutes or an hour. Uh, you have to have an agenda to it. If you, it's got to be more than 15 to 20 minutes, we try to do more things by Slack than anything else. Easy, simple to get things done. Send a doc, you need feedback, get a review, whatever. Send a doc 24 hours in advance if it has to be a decision made at the end of that meeting. You set your team up for success with good, healthy mechanisms. And if a new idea is presented, we're going to ask you then, then what goes away? If you're going to introduce a new meeting or a new meeting mechanism, then what goes away? Simple. I like that. And, and very intentional. Yeah, for sure. Like I have a regular leadership team meeting every week. Uh, hey, we need to, to review people, scale and scope of what people are doing. Like we're not making another team meeting. We're going to take that team meeting this week. We're going to repurpose it to do this. And we're much more effective. We're not another meeting. People can still be parents. People can still be coaches. They can be caregivers. They can be spouses, significant others, and do all the things they need to do outside of work and have a good work life balance. And that's something that we don't talk about in scalability or being a scaling organization or be healthy and productive at executing scale is when people don't feel like they have a good work-life balance, they don't always think clearly. They don't always make the best decisions. They're not fresh in their thoughts and their ideas because they're not rested and healthy. We got to think about scaling is a part of resting feeling engaged, feeling a work-life balance, a sense of I can have prior time to prioritize and make these things that are important, important. And man, it changes the way people show up at work. Yeah, I'm sold. That's good. <laughs> I guess related to this, or maybe a consequence is... Um, how do you drive accountability? Oh, this is a good topic. And I think um, <laughs> uh, there's a good book I read once called The CEO Paradox, The Paradox of CEO. 
The paradox is accountability. Why? It's because everybody thinks, hey, I'm the CEO. But the paradox is that actually you're the most accountable person in the actual organization. So what I think about accountability is accountability starts with me. And accountability is real from these types of things. And it may seem nuanced. It may seem juvenile, but here's the, here you go. The reality is showing up to meetings on time, accountability. You have to model accountability to get your culture to buy into accountability and believe in it. So I respond to every one of my team's emails or Slack messages the same day. I always respond, even if the response is, I'm reviewing it. I will follow up within 24 hours. Got it. Thank you. When would you like me to re- you know, follow through or follow up? Every one of my team's response uh, emails to me because if they took the time to write an email, they took the time to send a Slack, they took the time to communicate to me via our time, our communication portal, then I should at least take the time, hold myself accountable and respond. If I set a meeting or set up a one-on-one or I set up a touch base, I can at least show up and be on time and be prepared and be present and nowhere else. I can at least expect if I tell them to focus on this in their review or their uh, that we do every year, here's their opportunity area. Every time I want to touch base with them, that's going to be a part of every conversation that we have and say, I'm going to at least, how are you doing in the area? What do you need to focus on? What did you learn the last time that you did this? What did you get feedback on from your team in terms of how you're coming along in this particular area? Accountability starts with me. And you can actually have empathy and authenticity, authenticity at the same time as accountability. They actually go hand in hand. Here's another way to practice that. Hey, good to see you today for a touch base. You bring in your, your document, you drop in your weekly touch base document that we share, that I make updates in and you make everything. So that's first of all, that's follow up from the last week. See how you know. But the first five minutes is always about you. Very intentional, very... How was your week? How is your family? How are you doing? Being present and nowhere else, that's accountability. That's being intentional. That's following up. Because accountability is nothing but following up on your agreements. Did you do what you said you were going to do? And I'm going to hold you accountable for you doing what you said you were going to do. People will hold themselves more accountable if they see you holding yourself accountable. So accountability starts with me. There's nothing like a culture that people hold themselves to the bar before you do. Great leaders don't have to talk about accountability because people say, hey, I own that. I dropped the ball. When you have an ownership culture, which I equate to an accountability culture, The leader is supporting the culture and the culture is being led by peer. Accountability is being led by peers. Accountability is followed up by customers. The bar is so high that everybody sees it as their responsibility to be owners and accountability. That's a beautiful thing when it doesn't all pivot or have to be the standard bearer for accountability. It has to be the boss. Yeah. I'm super inspired. I, I knew uh, I anticipated, but not at that to that point. So, um, thank you, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, I hope uh, everyone will will enjoy it because um, I'm enjoying a lot. Thank you. You're more than welcome, and thank you for taking the time to ask the questions. Thank you for being present, and also I appreciate the initiative that you're doing because we need to do 
more to create an opportunity for people to hear best practices, to hear ideas, because we need to build and be intentional about everyone building their treasure chest. And if we got a treasure chest of tools where everybody's pouring into everybody's treasure chest, and you have multiple tools that everybody has got a, ha- a saw, a screwdriver, a hammer, a you know, nail gun, you know, all these great tools will make a great place to work because people will feel like their needs are being met because they have authentic leaders that are willing to say, hey, I'm self-aware. I need to get better at using a hammer and you need a hammer and we're going to work on this together. So you hold the nail. I'm going to hold the hammer. We're going to practice this together. That's super cool. Uh, I mean, (laughs) how, to be honest, that's really good. Okay, what so um, what it's all about? We, I want to be respectful of, of your time. It's late already uh, in in your place of the world. So um, two last questions. The first one would be: if you have one book to recommend, what would that be? Hmm. One book that you wish to to offer to everyone. This is probably counterintuitive, but this the great the book that I would recommend. Number one is the iceberg is melting, and once you read it, you will understand that it is important for us to recognize when the iceberg is melting, not to stay on the iceberg, but to actually go out and look and explore and be comfortable changing environments. And that we can't sit on the iceberg that is melting and deny that it is melting. <laughs> so uh, it's a great leadership book. It's about a, an hour to read, but phenomenal book. And I had an opportunity to change my company um, back in 2007 when the economic turn, turn came. And um, I gave that book to my CEO and he allowed me to create a product that changed our entire company. And kept us from laying off about a thousand people because we were able to do something differently because we, we weren't in denial that our iceberg was melting. Wow. That sounds super inspiring again. So <laughs> looking forward to read it, to reading it. Wow. All of us have an iceberg that's melting. Every one of us. It's a behavior that we don't want to own. Uh, it's a practice that we should retire. Um, but the fear, and again, that people, this is a little bit counterintuitive. People often say people fear the unknown. But the truth is, we actually fear losing the known. Because when we're comfortable in our ways, we're comfortable with our environments, we're comfortable with a certain kind of people around us that speak a certain language, that are in a certain mm-hmm. neighborhood or a certain community. We are so safe and comfortable, but we all have those deep places that we don't want to talk about, that we are afraid of um, in uncertain times or challenging times or hiring difficult people that may be different from us or a skill that we need to work on that we don't want to admit. But it's not about the fear of the unknown. It's actually fear of losing the comfort of our known. That's a Great way to to conclude this episode, I guess. Although I have one last question. Oh, sure. Ask away. What other leaders should I invite next? What leaders should you invite next? Um, <laughs> oh, man, he's... He's passed away. Actually, Colin Powell would be. <laughs> uh, he has a great book too. Uh, the Squirrel Story in his book about Ronald Reagan is a great book uh, to read. Um, but to be honest, I think a person that you should invite next is Matt Garman. 
And here's why I think Matt Garman is a great person to invite next. I think we sometimes take for granted what our leaders are going through during tough times. Uh, it's easy to criticize or, or question our leaders about decisions that they make or why they make certain decisions. But when you hear it from their point of view and see it through their lens, you get a different point of view because um, people may, you know, struggle with returning to office, for example. Why do we make that decision? You know what? I actually have a lot of respect for Andy and the team for making those decisions because if I was invested in a company called Acme Company and I that CEO needed to make some difficult choices as a shareholder for me to feel good about what the next of quarter or quarters were going to do, and he or she had to make tough decisions, I would want them to make that decision. And I would want them to do what is right and what's best, even if the, the choices are difficult. So I think a good point of view around the next leader would be a Matt Garman, because what about the lens that he's looking through right now uh, with the times that we're facing and a company that's been thriving so for so many years, 25 years, we've never had a to turn a corner like we're turning a corner now. So it's definitely things we're facing or challenging or dealing with things that we never dealt with before. So how is he doing? How is he feeling? Who asked him, how is it going with you? Um, it would be interesting to get his point of view of how he's doing and what has he learned the most about his leadership having going through those really upswings and things. Oh, man, that rocket is going out. And to see sometimes when you have to deal with something very different. Um, so I, that would be who I would recommend. Wow. That's a good challenge. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. Thank you so, so much, Daryl. Uh, so much insights um, and wisdom. So uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I've learned a lot. And uh, hopefully um, we are going to inspire a lot of people today. So um, thank you. Thank you no, so thank much. You. you should make sure you take a picture and share it. I can share it with my team of us on the screen. I don't know if you can take it, but it'd be good for you to share a picture and I can tell them about the great podcast that I had with you today. That's perfect. Yes. yes. <laughs> and I like to share because again, being intentional is extremely important. So thank you very much. Thank you, Devil. Take thank care. you so much. Have a good rest of your day, my friend. You stayed until the end. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Paid Forward Society. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and share it with at least two people who would benefit from this discussion. Your support helps me reach more people and make a greater impact. You can also help me get discovered by leaving a five-star rating and a review on your favorite podcast platform. I appreciate your support and look forward to continuing this journey with you. Bye.